Welcome to Computer Networking. This is Chapter 3, Part 2, where we look at reliable transportation. So we've started to look at the UDP, or User Datagram Protocol, and we found that that does not provide any level of reliability. It's still a transport protocol, but it doesn't deal with any errors. It leaves that up to the application. The alternative that we typically find in the Internet Protocol Suite is the TCP, or Transmission Control Protocol. And TCP is designed to be reliable, to provide for ordered delivery of packets no matter what order they arrive at the receiver. The TCP is error checked, meaning that it has uh, values that it can use to verify that the data has arrived is correct and without any error. Uh, there is a connection protocol that allows a TCP socket to be established and remain open so that once that negotiation has taken place, it doesn't need to be repeated. And it has built-in congestion control so that it doesn't flood the network with a pile of data that um, can kind of saturate all of the devices. But the TCP protocol to be able to do this requires a stateful TCP kernel. And this is often implemented inside an operating system, but it doesn't have to be. For example, in embedded systems, we could theoretically run an embedded TCP stack. This is the terminology that you'll hear. Um, but somewhere, something needs to keep track of what state this connection is in. It also needs to provide this operation independent of network activity. So typically we're going to see that the TCP protocol requires some use of timers. And those timers are going to be used to kind of detect when a packet hasn't been uh, received by the receiver. Like it hasn't been acknowledged. And then it will resend it. All of this work requires additional latency. So for something like the DNS system that we just looked at in part one, the latency of DNS is very low. I send a request, boom, and I get the response back. Boom. <laughs> just that simple. In the case of TCP, if we were to do TCP-based DNS, I would first have to negotiate an open connection, and that's going to be several datagrams that are exchanged to establish the connection and acknowledge the, the, the connection creation on both sides. Then I can send the request, then I can get the response, but then I have to acknowledge both. So when I send the request, I have to wait for the DNS server, or I would have to wait for the DNS server to reply, to say, hey, I got your request. And then the DNS server would say, hey, here's your data, and then it's going to have to leave that connection open while I reply and say, yeah, I got that data. And then I'm going to say, okay, I'm done talking to you now. I'm going to close the connection. And that's going to be a whole series of negotiations. And so TCP, to send even small amounts of data, has a bunch of overhead. That overhead is kind of small when compared to very large chunks of data. But it can add up very quickly if I'm just moving small frames around. Maybe UDP might be the best strategy for that. So, and that kind of speaks to the second one here where the TCP is um, going to add additional messages and that um, not only contributes to the latency but also contributes to an inefficiency, a certain amount of overhead of moving data back and forth. And it leaves the servers vulnerable to attack. So if I can spoof one side of the sending address versus uh, and convince the sender, the server, that I am the original sender, I can kind of uh, hijack somebody's open network socket. Because uh, remember, these aren't like physical wires. These are virtual circuits. And so it's possible that somebody could inject data into the data stream. We'll talk about that in the network security chapter. But understand that it's part of or kind of built into the vulnerability is built into the way TCP works. So if TCP is going to be a reliable protocol, how do we get reliability when we have an unreliable network underneath of us. And what we really want out of this is an abstraction. We want to kind of create this imaginary error-free network where two computers are talking directly to one another 
without any errors, without any overhead, without anything in between. That's, that's what application programmers really want. And, and I'm not trying to pick an application programmer. That's a good thing to have. But that's not the reality. And so we want to make this abstraction work but understand that we're gonna to have to do some of our some work in the network stack to make this happen. So in the case of reliability, when an upper layer goes to send data, uh, the application just assumes that the data is getting there. And if it didn't, then we wanna report an error to the request to send data. So for example, if I have a socket and I do a write command to that socket to send data, Write's either gonna come back and say okay, or it's gonna say error. Okay means the remote side got the data. Error means the remote side did not get the data. And either way, I know, one way or the other. And it's not even that it's like it hasn't gotten the data yet. It means literally it could not send the data to the remote side. Um, it's made the best effort, but it's the, the remote side's gone. When we receive data, we want to be able to deliver that data to the application and the application will receive that data correctly or will generate an error report back to whoever sent the data. So when we get something on the network layer coming up, we extract the TCP data, we give it back to the socket, it gets read. And at that point, we're gonna send a message back saying, I acknowledge that your data and it's been delivered. So a very conscientious postman, think uh, certified mail, right? So we know that somebody has received that message. Now, um, and then finally, the upper layers are completely independent of this operation. So it's not like when I go to send data that I have to take ownership of checking the data to make sure that it's received correctly. Um, that will be done for me by the TCP stack. And we make no assumptions about the lower layer capabilities. We just assume that the lower layer can somehow deliver an IP datagram, because that's really what TCP does. It, it, it puts itself into um, an IP datagram, but that's the next chapter. So we'll learn more about that coming up. What this allows is it allows applications to be developed without regard to the actual implementation of this. You know, the, we've been using TCP as application developers for um, already in this class, certainly in many different classes where we can just open a network socket, throw data in, and nobody has ever worried about the actual state of that TCP traffic. So from that perspective, that abstraction has worked. We're gonna try to focus on exactly what messages are being ex um, exchanged and how to diagnose what happens when something has gone wrong. Um, and so we're gonna try to un pull back the veil a little bit and see what's, what's happening there. And the other goal here is that this transport protocol can sit on top of other lower layers that provide some mi very minimal set of functionality, typically just IP. But TCP works well over wired networks, it works over wireless networks, it works over serial ports, it works over cell phone links, it works over VPNs. I mean, it, it's a pretty robust protocol uh, at, at that point. Um, I do want to point out one thing about reliability. I don't think the book does a nice job of, of explaining. When we say reliable, we just mean that whatever data was sent was sent with some level of fidelity. Um, I like that term better. So what we mean here is that some bits went across the wire and they were received exactly the same. Now, the message itself could be borked. For instance, I can use TCP and open up a web browser connection and send a web browser report that's malformed and the web server is gonna to have to deal with that. That's not the reliability that we're talking about. We're just talking about that if I sent that request, the bad request, it arrives as the bad request. No change has been made. Uh, that's reliability or I think fidelity, like I said, I think fidelity almost might be a better term, but the term that we do use in the industry is reliability. So we'll stick with it. So how do we get our reliable protocol? So we're gonna work our way up to this because if we jumped straight into TCP, it would be a little overwhelming. Well, it'd be a lot overwhelming. 
So we're going to kind of start small and we're going to go through a series of mini steps. And this follows the textbook pretty closely, but I read through the textbook and there's just a lot of, of, of words. And I think sometimes seeing the visualization really helps. So um, we're going to have some abstract functions and we're going to have a couple more as we go along. But to start off with, we have these functions RDT send is what the application would invoke to send data. RDT receive is what the application or what the lower layer invokes to mark receiving data. We're going to have a, a command to packetize or encapsulate application data into a transfer layer packet. We'll be able to send or receive data from the unreliable network. Um, and then we can extract application data from a, um, like these guys are basically inverses of each other. So we can extract the data from a transfer layer packet. Um, and then we can call deliver data to deliver data from the transport layer to the application. And we start off really, really simple. So this is actually not a state. This So we'll back up a second. I, I kind of mumbled. Um, this is the state machine. Of, um, the state machine is used to kind of give a graphical representation of what is going on with the connection and it allows us to remember what state we are in and so state machines always have some kind of event or trigger that's going to cause the state machine to do something and then wait for the next event or trigger so that's a little bit different than just running loop code in a for loop for example i mean you could, i guess you could kind of say the for loop is looping back up to the top, but here we're just waiting for some kind of external trigger. Um, in the case of the sender, we're gonna wait for the application code to invoke the state machine. That's what it means for the wait for call from above. And when that event happens, what's, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do what this says. We're going to be called by RDT send and when RDT send is invoked by the application layer, we're going to packetize that data and we're going to put it over the unreliable data network. Again, this is not, let me actually might write this out, this is not reliable. This is just a kind of a, a starting point. Meanwhile, on another computer, the receiver um, is kind of waiting for an event from the network layer. And so the receiver is sitting here and once it is detected that a packet has arrived, we'll receive the packet, extract the data and deliver it to the application layer. Great. Where, not link layer, network layer, um, network layer, typos. Um, where does the receiver deliver data to? Um, to memory. And then it'll signal to the application to read from that memory buffer, right? So, you know, it'll just kind of hold on to it. Um, this is effectively the UDP protocol. There, there's no attempt at error correction. And in fact, here we're not even asking, is it correct? Like, is it, is it matching checksums? We don't even ask that. So we're not even UDP. We're literally just, here's the data that I got off the wire. And if it's, hope, hope you like it. So what we can do with this simplicity though is, is kind of learn the analysis techniques. And then we're gonna try to use this diagram. This is a timing diagram that we can fill in for how data gets sent. And then we can try to play what if games, like how would it look if something bad has happened, like data gets corrupted. So let's go ahead and give this a try. So we're gonna to try to send four packets. And so when I go to send four packets, at some time interval, the sender is going to try to uh, send a message to the receiver. And so uh, receiver gets the message and that's what this thing says. So when we get this call from above, we made the packet, and then we send the packet. Over here, the receiver received the packet, it delivered it to the application. Um, the next time the sender can start sending data 
to the receiver. The sender sends packet number two to the receiver and then finally packet number three to the receiver. So that's packet zero, packet one, packet two, and packet three. And if we were looking at the wire, we would see that the sender is busy here, here, and here for whatever unit of time uh, one of those vertical graticules, there's a new name for you, graticule. Um, and that's just a marker on a display like this. Um, so if each graticule represents uh, 10 microseconds or 10 milliseconds or 10 hours, whatever the, the thing is, it represents time. So the sender is, is busy for four units of time. Um, the receiver is busy during this time interval. Well, the receiver is, okay, so this is actually one of the things I, I, I'm not explaining well. This represents the actions of the sender. This represents the actions of the receiver. That makes sense. But we have two separate communications channels. I have one channel, one wire for the sender to send data to the receiver. And then I have a different wire for the receiver to send to the sender. So we could choose to draw it with TX and RX on both sides. So this is the sender and this is the receiver. The trick is that that makes it look like we're receiving on the transmitter. So the sender has a TX and an RX and the receiver has a TX and an RX. So look what happens if, if we were to kind of observe, I have like some kind of magic eyeball. Let's see if I can draw a magic eyeball. And I'm looking at bits flowing across the wires at any instant in time. So when I start receiving, there's gonna be kind of a delay from the time that I start sending data until it's received. And when we draw this line here, we're really saying is it's a pretty thick line. And then likewise, this is a pretty thick line, and this is a pretty thick line, and this is a pretty thick line. Because these things take time. I can only send one bit at a time. And if I were to watch the, the data flow, I would see individual bits flow through here um, for however long it takes to deliver the, the, the packet, 10 milliseconds. Meanwhile, I don't see anything going on on the receiver. So the receiver is completely unused. It's not sending anything. Oops. And I goofed. This would be receive NTX. So this is kind of a, an imbalanced system here. The receiver doesn't actually ever respond. Um, what happens in the middle of this if one of these packets got deleted halfway through its, its transmission? So we sent here in two, but it never got here on the receiver. Receiver will never know. In fact, it might not even know that that packet was lost. There's nothing that identifies this at the transport layer that says that this is you know, packet zero, packet one, packet two, and so on. So this is really impractical, but at least it lets us kind of eyeball what's going on with these timing diagrams. So the, the next improvement the textbook goes through is to add some error detection and to communicate and say, yep, I got your data. And so what's gonna happen here is we're gonna add a message called an acknowledgement or a negative acknowledgement, which is abbreviated as NAC or NAC. So an ACK is success, a NAC is an error, negative. So in this case, we have a state machine where when we go to the application request to send some data, we'll send it. And then we'll sit here and wait for that acknowledgement to arrive. And if the acknowledgement arrives and it's in the negative, we'll resend the data. On the other hand, if the acknowledgement arrives and it's in the affirmative, 
then we will do nothing. We're done. We're, we've sent that packet of data. Uh, and likewise, here on the receiver, when we receive data, if it's corrupt, then we'll send a negative. And if it's OK, we'll send a positive. And we will deliver the data to uh, the application layer. So we can do the same kind of thing that we did before. Um, but this time we can kind of see what's happening between sender and receiver and then hopefully we'll be able to, to, to try the second case of what happens if packet 2 is dropped. So first of all, let's just see what happens if we can send the data in the first place. So at some time we're going to send packet 0 and when we do, so I can use a straight edge here, nope. And so when we do, the packet arrives, and we assume that these are all OK, so not corrupt. We're going to follow the rule over here. We're going to pick out the data, deliver it to the application layer, and then we're going to send an acknowledgment. Now, I'm going to use a different color for the receiver sending data. So in response to this, the receiver is going to send an acknowledgment. And so now, at this point, the sender, go back to bread. So the sender can look at this and say, what is the acknowledgment? Is it a success or not? And in this case, it is. So we're done sending packet 0. So now the sender is going to send packet 1. Whoops. Computer art is hard. So we're going to stop. Yeah, this is really hard to draw. Freehand. All right, so we're going to send the second packet. So packet one. And in this case, we said it's going to be received OK. So we're going to send that acknowledgment. And then we're going to send the next packet, packet two. And once it's received, still everything's OK. Ah, you're supposed to be blue. So we're going to send our fourth packet, which is packet number three. And we're going to say that that was received OK. And then we're done. So that's what it's going to look like if everything is communicating just fine. Now, here's the interesting thing about this particular picture. I tried to make the point before that this timing diagram doesn't show how the communication lines are actually being used. Like, if we look at this, it looks like the sender and the receiver are constantly sending stuff. But as I said before, we really do have two channels. We have one channel, which is the sender sending data. And we can kind of imagine at some point that the sender has put a bit onto the wire and then that bit is kind of traveling down the wire until it finally is received. Meanwhile, the second bit is coming down the wire right behind it, right? So that's like a wave front moving down the wire. And from the perspective of an observer looking at how much of the time is this wire being used, this wire is being used uh, to send at least one bit um, whenever we're doing one of these units of, of time here. So if we were to look at this as time in this direction, we're going to send a block of data for some measure of time. And then we're waiting for that acknowledgment. And then we're going to send another block of data, and another block of data, and another block of data. Meanwhile, from the receiver's perspective, the receiver's channel, so remember the receiver is using this to send acknowledgments. 
there's a period of time where it's idle and then there's another period of time when it's sending an acknowledgement. So the sender sent data, we acknowledge, sender sent data, we acknowledge, sender sent data, we acknowledge, sender sent data, and we acknowledge. Now, this leads to a complication, um, which we'll look at coming, kind of coming up, but this is really not using the available bandwidth of these wires very efficiently. Um, this is only used 50% of the time, and this is only used 50% of the time. And actually, this could be less than 50% of the time if these acknowledgements are small. And they probably would be just a few bytes. Um, and so then this leaves this thing to be less than 50% used. So um, the other th problem that we see in this picture is uh, what happens if packet two is dropped? We didn't answer that question. So if packet two is dropped, we're going to see that the sender sends packet number zero and the receiver is going to acknowledge that. We're going to send packet number one. And then the sender is going to acknowledge that. The receiver is going to acknowledge that. And then we're going to send packet number two. But this thing is, is going to be dropped somewhere in transmission. It's going to be lost. It's not going to arrive. So then over here, this event is never triggered. We never get that arrival of another packet, so we never send an acknowledgement. So we will never send an ACK or a NAC, which means over here, uh, once I've sent this packet number two, we're gonna spin or we're gonna wait inside this loop until we receive the acknowledgement but that acknowledgement never comes because packet two never arrived. So if packet two is dropped, then we, we stall and we'll never come back from uh, waiting for the acknowledgement. And the same thing here, the receiver is gonna be constantly waiting for the next packet. So, um, a dropped packet in this particular version is going to lock up these machines and it's just going to be um, not reliable. We, we are not re reliable in the face of an error. So we still need some improvement. So one thing that we can do is we can modify the state machine and, oh, let's, so let me go back one more time here. What if the acknowledgement for packet two gets dropped? So in this case, um, packet arrived and that packet gets dropped. We're in the same boat. Um, that arrival will never be de detected by the receiver um, and so both sides will still stall. So either way, we're going to get stuck if we've lost a packet. What if it's the packet arrives? So packet two gets waxed in transmission. And it arrives as a malformed packet. It's corrupt. So in this case, what's gonna happen is we're going to reply with a NAC. And because we came back with a NAC, we're going to resend packet two again. And then hopefully, theoretically, uh, we'll acknowledge that. And now this time we got, we can resume our normal 
operation. So this is resend two and now we send three and hopefully we acknowledge three and we can resume execution. So it is reliable in the face of um, corrupt data but it can't handle lost data. So one of the interesting things that we can we can look at is do we need to have a special NAC packet? Like can we eliminate the NAC altogether? And it turns out that by using a sequence number, um, what we can do is we can allow for the state machine to keep track of what packet number is being sent, either a packet zero or a packet one. And when we acknowledge, we can either acknowledge the, the ACK or the NAC here, right? So I can acknowledge packet zero or acknowledge packet one. And it turns out that if we simply um, turn our negative acknowledgement to an acknowledge the last successfully received packet, we get this version of the state machine that can um, help deal with ordering constraints. Um, and we don't need to have a special NAC packet. But let's move on to um, a little bit more robust of a machine. So, to deal with the loss of data where a message is not actually received, uh, what's going to have to happen is we're going to need to add timeouts. And the, the way this is going to work is we're going to send data. And if the data is acknowledged, fantastic. If the data is uh, not acknowledged successfully, then we're going to do nothing. We're just going to stay waiting. So if the, let me refine this a little bit. If the data is received, it's not corrupt, and it's acknowledging the right packet, we stop the timer and we're, we're done or ready for the next packet. On the other hand, if the data um, is acknowledged, but it's corrupt, um, then we're going to um, do nothing because it's it, if the data that comes back to the sender is corrupt, it's a, a corrupted ACK message. Or if the data is an ACK message but it's for the wrong sequence number, we wait. We don't do anything. And if another message arrives that is a valid ACK message, then we're fine. We just pick up where we left off and we finish. But if nothing happens and the timeout expires, then that means we need to assume that either our message didn't arrive to the receiver or the receiver's acknowledgement got lost in transmission. And so we need to restart the data. So we're going to resend this last packet. And what's going to happen on the receiver is we're either going to receive the last packet or we're going to receive the next packet. Now, how do we know the difference? And that's what these sequence numbers are all about. So in the case of the receiver, if the receiver is expecting the, uh, the next data message to be sequence zero, then if it receives sequence zero, it knows that it's got the right message. If the receiver receives message one or sequence one, then it knows that it's going to have been a resend of the previous message. And in, if it's a resend of the previous message, if it's already delivered that message, it doesn't need to deliver it again. So then the receiver can just ignore it and acknowledge. So it'll send another acknowledgement. If it never saw that sequence in the first place, in other words, if the receiver is still sitting here waiting for the receive of sequence one, 
then it would deliver that new sequence one packet to the application layer and send an acknowledgement. So using sequence numbers, um, as we saw on the last couple examples, allow us to resend data from one side or the other, and then adding timeouts allows us to detect when a message has been dropped. So uh, sequence numbers allow resend due to corruption. Timers allow resend due to dropped message. Now, the, the textbook authors have a question where in homework you're asked to draw the state machine for the receiver. And if you look back at what the receiver's logic here is, it'll look very similar, very, very similar. This is the state machine that deals with corrupted data for the receiver. And so your job is gonna to be to modify this for what happens during a timeout. The one piece of advice I'm gonna give you is receiver does not use timers. doesn't need them um, because the sender is going to be responsible for waiting for the acknowledgement and if it times out resending the data so really if you're going to do this homework problem what you've got to do in your receiver is just decide is the data that I've just received this new packet is this a resend of a packet that I've already seen or is it a re is it a new packet and then deal with is it corrupt or not corrupt, right? So that's all you've got to do in your receiver. So without, I can't say too much more without actually giving away the answer. Um, what we're describing here is a, a kind of a protocol called stop and wait. And what's happening is that stop and wait only allows one packet to be in flight at a time. And that can add up to long latency for multiple packets. Suppose, for example, that a message required four packets to be sent um, at the application layer before the receiver could actually start reading the values out of it. I'd have to wait for four complete cycles before the receiver can actually begin or the executing the code. So long delays um, as a consequence of this. The other thing is, and I alluded to this before, we have very low utilization. So it's hard to see how these pipes would be used from the timing diagram, but if we draw it out as, you know, what's being sent over the wire at a given time, we'll see that the utilization could be as high as 50%, but it also could be quite a lot lower. Especially when you, if you do look at the timing diagram, you see what happens during something like a message gets lost, the message is gonna get lost and we're gonna end up being idle for the entire time of the timeout. Nothing is happening here on either side. No one is sending, no one, and the, the sender's not sending and the receiver's not transmitting. So when we're losing packets, not only do we have the problem of uh, overhead or of sending the data over again, we also have a relatively high uh, time when nothing is being transmitted at all um, and that can be a problem. Um, balancing timeout is really really crucial here. If I make my timeout too small we get this premature timeout problem and in the premature timeout problem I am not giving enough time for a long communication link. For example if my user is in California and I'm here on the East Coast, um, we could be looking at 15 to 20 milliseconds delay just for the speed of light um, to go from uh, the East Coast to the West Coast and back again. So if I were to set my, my timeout based on that round trip time, that's gonna be fine until I have somebody from Europe try to use my system. And there the overhead could be quite a bit larger and so what's gonna end up happening is my timeout becomes too small and I start having lots of retransmissions and performance goes out the window. So stop and wait is, is relatively simple 
but it's very inefficient. Now we'll skip that slide. So just like what we saw in comp org, when we look at using a pipelined processor and we're going to have multiple instructions in flight at a time, an almost identical application of the pipelining technique can be done to the transport layer. And what we're going to do is we're going to allow multiple packets to be in flight at a time. And instead of just having one sequence number that we're working on, we're going to have multiple sequence numbers. We're going to have a, like a range of sequence numbers. And the number that we deal with here is going to um, have a direct relationship to performance and cost to recover. So for example, I, for high performance, I might want to have a large number of packets in flight, but then when something has gone wrong, I have to be able to resend all of those in-flight instructions. And so that large number could end up uh, costing me quite a lot of, of time. The other thing is we're going to need to have some kind of a, a buffer to hold all of those packets. And so the more packets I have in flight, the larger the memory costs are going to be. So you can imagine, for example, on a small embedded processor, I might not have enough memory to support 32 packets in flight. And so the memory starts to become a choke point on those small systems. And finally, we need to have rules that are going to determine how we deal with bad or missing data. And there are two basic strategies that we get here. We get something called the go back n strategy or the selective repeat strategy. And we'll take a look at both of these. Um, and then we can kind of compare which one is better. Go back n allows at most n unacknowledged packets in flight. And the sequence numbers are going to be of fixed length. And we just need to make sure that the sequence numbers are larger than n. I can't have multiple sequence numbers with the same value in the window. And I'm, I introduced the term here. So n is going to be what's called a window size. And what's going to happen is if you were to look at packets being sent over time, the window size here is going to be the number of, of packets that we're paying attention to at any given instant. And so we're going to keep track of, at most, n packets in flight. And what all we're really saying here is that as we successfully receive packets at this end, we're going to start sliding the window over so that we can look at the next packets in time. This is a virtual thing. This is not. So this is a virtual or a logical view of how we're looking at packets over time. This is not how we would store the memory. So what's going to end up happening in this go back n is we're going to keep track of where the, the first packet that has not been acknowledged by the receiver. And when we get an acknowledgment from the receiver, if I were to, um, we'll see as we go through here, Let's say that um, the receiver acknowledges uh, this packet. So I've sent all of these, but the receiver has acknowledged this one, and I haven't seen an acknowledgment for those four. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the receiver saw this packet before it saw these other ones, and as a consequence, these probably were dropped. So I sent five packets, Actually, I probably sent, looks like here, eight packets. The first four didn't arrive at the receiver. And so because this is the first one that the, the receiver has acknowledged, I'm going to want to resend all of these packets. And yeah, we are really going to resend all of them. Uh, that's what it means to go back by n. So um, because these have been sent once and I didn't get the acknowledgement for them, then they're going to have to be resent. Um, 
Let's take a look at um, some better details of this and then we'll, we'll go through a timing diagram. So go back and sender responds to three types of events. It's either gonna happen from the application layer sending a message, the receipt of an ACK, and the um, go back by N is gonna change the way we, we think of acknowledgements to be this thing called a cumulative acknowledgement. So all packets with the sequence number up to and including N in the acknowledgement message are noted as correctly received, moving the window forward. Um, and then we're also gonna have a, that, that same timeout thing that we saw before. So a timeout, uh, the sender is gonna resend all the packets in the window that have been previously sent, but not act. The receiver has really just one event, and that is the receipt of a packet. If sequence N is received correctly and in order, the data is acknowledged. Um, if the order doesn't match or the data fails a checksum, then that's gonna be discarded. And we're gonna resend an acknowledgement for the most recently received in order and correct packet that we've we found. And it's this resend the last most recently received um, that's gonna be the trigger for this guy to, to do the go back by N. So this is a picture of the state machine from the textbook. It looks a whole lot more complex. Um, I'm not gonna go through and read it here. All right, I wanna go ahead and, and talk about this diagram. This is the same state machine that we just saw on this slide, but what I've done is I've turned it into what looks like source code. And on the blue, we have the sender logic, and on the green, we have the receiver logic. If you think back two slides, we said that there were three events that trigger the sender's state machine, uh, and that there was one event that triggered the receiver's state machine. So what we can do is we can kind of follow these rules and try to fill in this timing diagram. And I think this is a little bit easier than what we saw with the um, the uh, uh, state machine, like the graphical view. Uh, we'll see. All right, so we're gonna try to send six packets and we're gonna assume no errors during transmission. So this is like the best case scenario and we'll see what gets sent and how it gets sent. So the first time that we have anything happening, the application layer sends some data and it's going to uh, send some data and it's gonna look at next sequence number and next sequence number is one and is that less than or equal to base plus n is four, so that would be five. And yeah, one is less than five. And so that allows us to store the packet that the, the application layer has sent and then we're going to send that out over the wire. And the nice thing is, as soon as we deliver, finish delivering the, the message on the wire, um, we can go back to continuing the state machine's logic. And that says that base is now gonna equal the next sequence number, which it already is. And we're going to start a timer I don't have logic here for the timer. So let's say the timer is gonna start off here at, uh, at zero. And then we're gonna make next sequence number go up by one. Now, while we're sending, everything is, is, is just waiting for the send to finish. And at some point we're done sending. And so we're gonna come back to the next logic here, and that is uh, we're gonna be able to send, we're gonna call send data one more time for packet number two. And in this case, next sequence number is still less than five. So we get to put packet number two into the packet buffer. Uh, we get to put it out on the wire. And we get to um, follow the rest of this logic um, base is equal to sequence number, it's not, so we don't reset timer. Um, and then the next sequence number goes up to three. And in the meantime, we're gonna say timer is equal to one.
the timer is going to be some parallel process. It's a device that keeps track of the time, hence the name timer. Okay, so um, over here, at the same time that this happened, um, the receiver received a packet. It wasn't corrupt, so um, it's expecting sequence number. It received sequence number one. It expected sequence number one. Um, it's going to begin sending its acknowledgement. Um, and let's just add some delay. Let's say, for instance, that it takes longer for the received data to show up over here. So it sends this, it extracted the, the data, it delivered it to the application layer. We made an ACK for sequence one, we sent that, and now the next packet we're going to expect is two. And to be clear, we made send packet to acknowledge number one. So when we sent UDT send, we sent acknowledgement one. All right, so the next time that anything goes on here, oops, pen, color, go back to red. Um, 